Okay, welcome to High Cheese with Darren Maloney. Today is November 11th, 2022. And happy Veterans Day. If you know any veterans in your life or you have any veteran neighbors, just thank them. Thank them for their service. Thank them for their sacrifice. So here's what we know so far. We know that the Republicans are going to take over the House of Representatives. And the only question is, by how much? There's so much out there. So depending on who you ask, you get different numbers. But the last figures I saw is that right now you need 218 uh, Congress people for a majority. So according to the last count, uh, you need 218 representatives to have a majority, and right now the Republicans have a generally accepted 222. And that number can only go up. So we know that. And what we do know is that there are three outstanding Senate seats that have yet to be decided. Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia. And I am going to reserve any comments until these are resolved. Look, it's a victory in the House. The Republicans have taken over the House. And it's quite possible if things break the Republican way, they'll control the Senate also. But what's happened is the anti-Trump media, the Democrats, and the rhinos have been using this PSYOP to attack Trump. Now, it all started earlier in the uh, election night when Dr. Oz lost Pennsylvania. Everybody said, see, see, Trump is, you know, he's not, he hasn't performed. And I'm not going to knock Oz. I've always said he's not the perfect candidate. He didn't help himself in some cases. But he lost, and they're using uh, the media and the anti-Trumpers were using this to bash Trump. And then there were so many other outstanding issues with the elections that everything is just a blur right now. But here's what I think is happening. What I think is happening is that these elections on the West Coast and a lot of the other congressional elections are being slow walked just so these anti-Trump newspapers, which includes Fox News, the New York Post and the Wall Street Journal, rhinos, can try to... Stick the shiv into Trump's back. So what we essentially have had here is a a psyop, a baby psyop. Let's get Trump. Let's create this narrative from election night that Trump really lost really bad. The Republicans lost. Now, quite frankly, I was talking to a couple of Republicans the next day. They had thought that the Republicans lost everything. They lost the House. They lost the Senate. There was nothing there. And it was all Trump's fault. Lauren Boebert lost in Colorado. And this was the media message on election night. And they wanted to continue it against Trump. But I am reserving my opinion on this until the election is called. I want to know how many seats we got in the Senate. I want to know how many seats we got in the House before I start making uh, any judgments on anybody or anything. But here's what I do know. The knives are out. There's also a battle behind the scenes for our Speaker of the House and the Republican leader in the Senate. So apparently McCarthy was supposed to become Speaker of the House, but this is all up in the air right now. And then on the Senate side, Mitch McConnell wanted to have a vote. I think the vote is on November 16th. He wanted to have it on their leadership for the Senate. So Marco Rubio came out later this afternoon and said, wait, wait, hold on there. Let's uh, rethink this. We may, we may want to hold back on having this vote for the Senate leadership for the Republicans. So let me read you an article from the Gateway Pundit. And it says here that Senator Marco Rubio said Friday he believes the Senate leadership vote should be postponed until the candidates for the position are vetted for genuine commitment to fighting for the priorities and values of the working American. The Senate GOP leadership vote next week should be postponed, Rubio tweeted. First, we need to make sure that those who want to lead us are genuinely committed to fighting for the priorities and values of the working Americans of every background who gave us big wins in states like Florida, 
And Josh Hawley supports this position. And meanwhile, we have Senator Ron Johnson, Senator Mike Lee, Rick Scott. They're circulating a paper among other senators to postpone this vote. So you see what Mitch is trying to do. And, and Mitch, Mitch is a shrewd guy. It ain't about anybody else from him, but him. And what he's done is he has a pack and his own pack. It's uh, I forgot the name of the pack, but his pack is funding or moving millions of dollars into the Georgia runoff race. And what he's done is he's funding the get out the vote and the game day operations of Governor Kemp in Georgia, which is a very good operation. It's very, very good operations. But what he's doing is he f- he's funding the game day operation for Herschel Walker. And he's going to use Kemp's operation to help Herschel Walker. And he's funding it with his pack. So I know what he's trying to do. He's funding all this. He's telling everybody, look what I'm doing. I'm going to save us. My money is going to save us. We're going to get Herschel Walker elected. And it's going to be because of me. And that's what McConnell's doing. And that's why he's pushing for this vote. Because he thinks he can arm twist other senators. I'm doing all this for the uh, Republican Senate. Back me. Now, on the other side, there's a battle for Kevin McCarthy's leadership position. Apparently, he's supposed to take over as Speaker of the House come January. But there's a knife fight behind the scenes on this. There's a lot of names being thrown out there. I'm not sure that McCarthy's going to get the speakership. Because the knock on McCarthy is that he's not tough enough. And you have to understand the Speaker of the House, they're the ones that set the agendas. They're the ones that set the investigations and the committees. And there's a lot of power in that position. And they, and a lot of people have reservations about his ability to be tough. They want the Hunter Biden investigation. They want the FBI investigated. They want Mayorkas investigated. They want Biden investigated. And they think that McCarthy may be a little too soft. But that's what's going on behind the scenes right now. So again, we know that the Republicans are taking the House of Representatives. And we don't know what's going to happen in the Senate right now. Now, if the Republicans win Arizona, they win Nevada, and they win Georgia, they'll be up too. Because they flip two seats, Georgia and Nevada. I'm sorry, uh, they flip three seats, Georgia, Nevada. And Arizona, but they lost Pennsylvania, so the net gain is going to be two. And quite frankly, that's not a bad night. You take over the House of Representatives and you take over the Senate. That's not a bad night. But I'm going to reserve judgment. I'm going to wait till this entire thing plays out before I start saying whose fault it was, if there was any fault. So we shall see. Now, two interesting resignations came. One came before the uh, midterm elections, and one came uh, earlier today. And the first one, uh, which came before the election, was the resignation of a top FBI agent. And let me just read an article here. It's uh, from the Daily Wire. And the headline says, top FBI official who led Whitmer kidnapping plot, J6 investigations to retire. And it says one of the top officials in the FBI's Washington field office, Stephen D'Antono, is reportedly retiring from the agency at the end of the month. D'Antono is the assistant director in charge of the Washington field office. He was promoted in October 2020 from his previous position as special FBI agent in charge of the Detroit field office, where he oversaw the FBI investigation into the conspiracy to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. You remember that when three quarters of those involved were FBI informants. They were on the FBI payroll. He is expected to retire at the end of the month, according to a reportedly internal FBI memo. Uh, At his role in Washington, D'Antono has been one of the chief FBI officials in charge of the Bureau's investigation into the U.S. Capitol riot on January 6th. D'Antono has received scrutiny and criticism from Republicans over his handling of both the kidnapping conspiracy and January 6th investigation. 
The Antonio's departure come as re- uh, Republicans appear to be on the verge of retaking control of the House with a slim majority. The transferal of power away from Democrats and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi would give Republicans power to dictate House investigations and the FBI could be a target after numerous whistleblower leaks revealed potential corruption and allegations of politicization of the Bureau's highest levels. Now, the next article here, and this is from the Gateway Pundit, says here, Joe Biden's top immigration official is being forced out amid border crisis. It says Biden's top immigration official is being forced out of his job amid the border crisis. And this is from the Gateway Pundit. Chris Magnus, the commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, is being pushed out of his job by Alejandro Mayorkas. The commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection is being forced out of his job as part of a larger change in top personnel at the Department of Homeland Security, according to a government source. Uh, Magnus is resisting leaving the position after being told by Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas to resign or get fired, according to the source. It came after a record year of migrants seeking to enter the U.S. along the Mexican border. Magnus has been on the job for about one year, and sources say he has clashed with the Department of Homeland Security over border enforcement policy. Some of Magnus's duties have been taken over by his deputies. So I think these are two telling retirement slash firings and it has to do with the coming investigations i just don't know how both of these are going to play out but we're going to find out so just remember these two names as these investigations start to take place starting in january again so we shall see so for the first time i worked as a poll worker here in new jersey and i've worked in municipal government and county government for over 30 years And let me tell you, I have never seen a bigger SHIT show than on election day where I was working. Now, I would have said the word, but my mother's listening. So anyway, make a long story short. It's a long day. You wake up, uh, you got to be there at 5.15 in the morning and the polls close at 8 o'clock. And so it is a long day. And, you know, I do give credit to the workers that uh, were there because, uh, again, they it is a long day and they have to sit through the entire thing. And I'll get into that later. Uh, not thoroughly impressed with the workers, but uh, they showed up at 5.15 and they stayed the entire time. So you start, we started the day at 5.15. And prior to becoming a poll worker in New Jersey, you have to take some training. So you file with the clerk's office in your county and that you want to be a poll worker. And then you get an email back and it says that, okay, you've been accepted as a poll worker and we'll have training. So part of the training is these videos uh, outlining the voting process in New Jersey and as well as outlining the new, the new machines. I'll get into this later. They have new machines that they used in Morris County, New Jersey. Now, let me take a step back about Morris County, New Jersey. Morris County used to be a one of the few red areas in New Jersey, and now it's quite purple. Although the uh, county board, the county freeholder board, they're now known as commissioners, uh, are Republican. For all of the federal uh, elections, they've gone blue. So, you know, that's where we are with this. Now, the other thing, uh, Morris County gave us Chris Christie. So just remember that. So where was I? So they trained us. And uh, there were some videos that we had to uh, watch about Election Day. And there were some additional videos about the process and about the machinery that we were going to use. And then they had some live seminars for us, one seminar that we took. And I think in my prior episode, I had mentioned that the uh, the person from the clerk's office that was uh, leading the presentation on the machinery and, and the entire process was talking about ethics. And I was a little perturbed because he implied that the ethical thing to do is to say nothing if you saw something bad that was going on. I raised my voice. I, you know, I told him we have an obligation to uh, do something if we see something. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. At the end of the day, I think there's a relationship between that comment about doing nothing if you see something versus what happened on Election Day. And I'll get into that later. 
So you go through the training, and then they tell you where you are going to be signed, uh, what ward and district. So I get assigned at uh, one of the townships here in Morris County. And uh, I show up at, you know, 515. So what they did is they, you know, they had the uh, equipment. You had to put out printers. You had to put out um, this iPad that included the uh, the voting rolls. And there were several of them. They You lined up, lined them up, and you test them to make sure that they worked. So I knew things were going to be bad when as soon as the first batch of voters come in to vote, one of the printers go down. Now, you need these printers. To, they have to check in, and then they get a slip, and it allows them to vote in the voting booth later. So one of the uh, workers, they called the county, and the county was trying to you know walk them through fixing the printer. I, I find it really interesting that everything worked until the polls opened. And so what happened? One of the workers was calling the county, trying to get them to fix it, and they weren't successful with it. And at the time, eventually they fixed it, maybe 45 minutes later. But what really surprised me was that the representative at, from the county had told the worker to tell the people to come back later. Oh, tell the voters to come back later. Really? That's how you treat the voters of New Jersey? That's the, how you treat the voters of your district? And this is the problem with government today. This is the problem with the government bureaucracy today, and the politics. They want your vote, but they hate the voter. And imagine, I, I just, you know, I, I was just shocked. I was just shocked. I mean, that clearly, clearly would have been unacceptable in all the places that I worked, even corrupt H Hudson County. They would do everything to get the vote in, to get the voter in, but not today. It paints me the picture that the people are here to serve the government, not vice versa. And I think that's a big problem with what we have with government today. And this is why I do not like big government. So a few of the voters left. I don't know if they came back, but they were, were not happy. So Morris County has these new machines. It's by a company called ESNS or ESS. And brand spanking new. Nobody knows why they bought it. You know, the, the uh, previous machines work fine, everybody told me. Now, I voted there, and, you know, I, I, I'm not a big machine guy, but apparently, if you're going to stay with machines, apparently there was no reason to switch machines. But I know how this works. Uh, one day I'll explain to you how uh, these uh, voting machines and how these voting machines are picked in New Jersey, really uh, borderline uh, on corruption. Now, I'm not saying that the Morris County freeholders approved this contract with this company was corrupt, but uh, a lot of New Jersey counties picked these companies based on many factors. And one of those factors is not necessarily the integrity of the vote. So anyway, the machine was supposed to work uh, in a sense that uh, they gave you a slip of paper that was going to... You'd slip it into the machine. It was an uh, index card, maybe about two, two and a half inches by a foot or 14 inches. And you were supposed to slip that into the, to the machine when you got in the booth. And it was supposed to slide up into a window that showed you how you voted. And then the screen would come up with the ballot. You press who you wanted to vote for. And then you said print ballot. And what would happen and what supposedly would have happened is... All the people that you voted for were going to show up on that index card in that uh, in that window. And you were supposed to read it, confirm that it, these were the people. And you, you press cast your ballot, and then the machine would suck up the index card, the th two and a half inch by 14 inch index card, into the back of the machine. And I think the intent of this was that they wanted to match the electronic printout with what the actual um, manual printout that was uh, cast in the back of the machine by these uh, index cards. And I think that was the intent of it. The problem is it didn't work. And uh, I'll get into that later. You know, so the day went on and it was maybe about, I don't know, 11 o'clock in the morning. And one of the machines started glitching out. 
and there was you know like a a, a red X or a a, 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 cir- a red circle with an X in it. Said, oh, there's you know there's a, this problem, this that, this problem. So that started happening, and it just so happened that some so-called I think it was a master poll worker or something. He was a guy that was supposed to, I guess, you know, monitor all the polls in 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 the district. He came by. And he said something quite shocking, which actually surprised me. So I guess somebody mentioned to him that there was, you know, there, there was certain problems that were happening with one of the machines. And you know what his answer was? He says, listen, if you got any problem with these, with these machines, just go to the back and shake them. And it should fix it. And, and, I, and I'm like saying to myself, I said, wait a second. The county spent millions and millions of dollars on these brand new machines. And you got some master poll worker come in and say, well, if you have any problems, just remember you have to shake the bottom, uh, the back of the machine. That's how you fix these machines? We have to fonzy them. Uh, If the shake doesn't work, give it a kick. Or give it a punch in the side. So I, I, you know, again, I knew, (laughs) I I was just saying, this, this is absolutely an amateur hour. This is starting to get to be an amateur hour. So the day goes on. And I guess maybe it's about three hours, maybe it's around five o'clock. And it, there's a heavy turnout from what everybody told me that worked there before. I didn't know. It was my first time working. So they told me, yeah, it's a heavy turnout. So what happens is all the machines go down. So we've got about 75 to 100 people in line there waiting to vote. And the machines go down. Uh, so somebody calls the county, and they, the county says, oh, we'll have somebody down 10 minutes. 20 minutes go by. Nothing. Somebody else calls. Oh, we'll have somebody down. Just wait. You know, meanwhile, you've got these people in line. It's getting a little hot in there. There's no air conditioning, even though it's, uh, it's a, a township school. It's not open. There's no air conditioning. We get a no-show from the county. So I call. I said, look, this is the third time somebody's calling here from this warden district. And the person on the other end, the representative of the county says, well, this is the first time I heard of this. I'm like, what's going on here? I said, "We've we've had these machines down for 40 minutes. And we kept on saying, somebody's coming, somebody's coming. And nobody came. So now an hour goes by. Still nobody comes. And these people are getting agitated online. And, and quite frankly, I got I to gotta give credit to the people that were online. They were getting annoyed, but, and some of them left. They just had to. We had, you know, there, there were some people online with children that he, they're like, hey, I got to go feed my kids. And they left. So there were some lost boats. But I do give credit to the people that stayed. Many of them kept their cool. I know that if this, a similar thing happened in, say, Hudson County, there would have been fist fights in back. There would have been people rioting in the back. But it didn't happen here. So I give them credit. They were very patient. And uh, I admire some of them because they say, hey, look, it's my civic duty. If I have to wait three or four hours, I will. So again, as I said, it was an hour, hour and a half. Nobody should, uh, still a no show. So I call up. I say, look, there is nobody here. You could have problems in the back here because people are slowly getting agitated. And they go, oh, well, uh, you know, just uh, just uh, hand out the uh, emergency ballots. And I go, well, where are the emergency ballots? This was never, emergency ballots were never covered during orientation. Well, yeah, well, you know, they weren't, you know. So uh, where are they? And they said, oh, they're in this one, I think, red bag. And so they had to find them. So some of the workers had to find them. It took them 10 minutes because, you know, nobody, even the people that worked there for a number of years never came across emergency ballots. So they found them. And I think there was a total of 60 emergency ballots. And they said, you know, so I said, look, we finally found them, but we've only got 60 and we've got between 75 and 100 people waiting. And they're like, ah, oh, just do it. Just, you know, just do it. I go, can you send somebody down? With some more ballots? Nope, can't do that. And then I looked at the ballot. 
And the ballot was nothing more than a Xerox. There were 60 Xerox copies of, I think, the sample ballots that were mailed out to people here in New Jersey. I'm not sure if they mail out sample ballots in other states. But that's all that it was. So we, we find them. So I go, what's the process? And I hear silence on the end from the clerk's office. Silence. And I could tell right then and there, they didn't know the process themselves. And then she puts me on hold. And I know for five to 10 minutes, I'm just waiting and waiting and waiting on hold. Because she didn't know. She was asking how to do it. And then she says, well, this is what you do. Collect the, collect the ballots. And these are just Xerox ballots. Hand them out. Tell them to fill it out. And then you'll put them in the bag. Th- there's no integrity here. I said, is this the proper procedure? And then what I did is I went on uh, my iPhone and just looked up the regs on this. And the regs weren't very telling either. But it was clear that the person I was talking to at the county, these so-called experts, didn't know the correct procedure for the emergency ballots. So they were like this and that. And I said, look, I don't have a lot of confidence in what you're saying. And they put me in over two or three minutes. They said, ah, you know, don't, you know, no need for the, you know, if you don't, you don't have to do the emergency ballots. Um, you know, someone's on their way. So, you know, we waited more. People are getting more agitated. And you got to understand, more and more people are coming in while this is going on. And what's getting me is the county, it, they, the county spent millions and millions of dollars on this machine, these machines, and they didn't work. So we call again. You know, still, we're right, and somebody still hasn't come. Oh, well, you know, here's what you may want to do. You may want to go to the back of the machine. There's a, you got to pull out the canister that holds all the ballots. I go, oh, okay, why? He goes, well, there may be too many ballots in there. I go, well, what's the capacity? And they didn't know. One, one of the uh, poll workers said that the capacity on each ba- ba- machine was supposed to be 500. And I checked, we only had 300 in each machine. So they didn't know. But th- here's what they were telling me. Well, you know, just go to the back of the uh, the machine and pull out the uh, uh, the canister with the ballots. I go, well, wait a second. You're asking me to break certain seals and then pull the canister out and shake the canister and put it back in? Well, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. So you're telling me that I've got to break the closing protocol to shake these uh, can- these canisters? Well, yeah. I said, do you have the authority to do that? Oh, well, yeah, I think I do. Well, I said, I'm not doing this until we can get somebody to give us the authority to break these seals. And then shake the canister. Oh, well, well, we'll get back to you on that. So meanwhile, more and more people are coming in. More and more people are getting agitated. So finally, I think it was over after two, two and a half hours. Somebody from the county comes, one of the maintenance people for the machines. Oh, and let me, let me take a step back, too. A lot of the workers that were there, they said, hey, last year they gave us three machines. Why do we only have two machines? And this was an expected high turnout election. It was a midterm election, a highly contested midterm election. And they only gave the district two machines. So anyway, the guy comes in to fix the machines. He, he really didn't know. He goes, I think it's the canisters. So he came in with two empty canisters. Now, what he did is he broke the seal. He broke certain seals. And he took the canisters out and he put them in behind behind the uh, the desk. I wouldn't say it was a secure position or, or a secure location. So the the, the rep, you know, the, the maintenance guy from the county comes in, he's looking, he's fiddling with it and he's replacing the canisters. And I'm like, I tell him, I said, well, wait a second. I said, what went on here? He goes, I really don't know, but we think it's uh, uh, the canisters when they get maxed out. Or if somebody uh, sweats on the those index cards and it makes them a little moist, they get stuck in the machines. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, copy paper and copy machines. On humid days, copy paper gets uh, cop- paper gets stuck in copy machines on humid days. And he thinks that maybe that was the case here. And I'm like thinking, I said, did anybody ever check this? 
before Election Day. So he pulls everything out. Seals are broken on the canister. My point through this whole process, whether it was these emergency ballots, whether these canisters, and if there was, if any attorney wanted to come in from any opposition side, they could have just say, hey, look, the, you know, these, these uh, votes are invalid. Protocol was broken. The chain of custody was broken on these canisters, on these votes. But, it, you know, it, they're just so ambivalent about it. And it just undermines the people's confidence in these machines. And it all comes back to, oh, well, I, you know, these government officials, I'm the expert. I know what's the best for the election. As long as I'm confident in the election process, uh, it's okay. Not what the people think. Because let me tell you, there's several hundred people, I would say, that had their confidence in the those machines undermined by what went on that day. And they talked to other people. And what I mean by several hundred, there were people that were waiting, 75 people, and then people that l- line just got longer and longer and longer, and they had to wait. People said, well, what, what am I waiting for? Well, the machines went down. Why'd they go down? Uh, nobody knows. So it was a real S-H-I-T show. And it was an embarrassment. It should be an embarrassment to the people that picked those machines that are people that were in charge of making sure those machines worked, to the embarrassment of those that trained the poll workers. They weren't thoroughly trained. And I'll get into that in a couple minutes. But it was just a terrible, terrible portrayal of government. Now, one of the things I wanted to touch upon before I leave on this subject is the poll worker himself or herself and what we have to do to have a better poll worker. Now, you know, I've, uh, you know, we've all been voting for years. We see, see nice people there, but in many, many cases, they're just not competent. And in me, many places, they're volunteers. Like in New Jersey, uh, they pay three hundred dollars. I didn't know that. So I'm either going to take the three hundred dollars to give it to charity, or my dog is dying. Maybe you know, buy her stuff to make things a little easier on her. But we have to do something about getting a better poll work. And let me give you an example. So a lady comes in and she was working in another polling district, but lived in the district where I was working. And she explains to me, oh, you know, I, I, I work in another district. I'm on my lunch break and I wanted to come in and vote. I go, oh, go, okay. How's it doing? How you doing? Oh, okay, good. So I'm talking to her. She goes to, to the machine. She turns to me and says, uh, I don't know how these machines work. Could you show me how they work? I'm thinking to myself, what the heck is going on here? Did this woman go to training? And how did this person get to be a poll worker? And then she went to say, oh, yeah, I've been a poll worker for a number of years. I'm like, oh, geez. But that my point is, is that we got to get better people. She's probably a light, nice lady, but I'm not sure that she inspires confidence in the people that come in and vote. And there's got to be an answer to it. And, and one of the, my suggestions, and I'm just going to throw it out there, see what you think, is, you know, maybe we should make it your civic duty to work the polls. You know how they have jury duty? Maybe have something similar to jury duty for poll workers. You know, let's put some, let's put some people in there that just are not going through the motions, you know, make it, you know, make it something, you know, make it, uh, you know, something that if they have to take the day off from work, you know, it's like jury duty. They get the paid, you know, they get the date off paid, something along those lines. But we need to get better people in there. We need to get better machinery. We need to get a better process for our elections because they're, it's being undermined. It's being undermined by the incompetence of the bureaucrats, the people that are pushing these machines on these counties. And how they undermine the confidence. I can see how people's confidence is undermined in the process. I just saw it firsthand. My first time as a poll worker, and I saw it firsthand. Now, if it's happening to me here, it's got to be happening all over the place. So there's got to be a better way. And this is not a political issue. There has to be a better way. People on both sides of the aisle have to focus on this. Voter integrity, voter confidence is important to democracy. And when we have a mass media out there 
that doesn't want to look that, yeah, there is a problem with how the vote has taken place. There are glitches. Technology doesn't work necessarily all the time, and it undermines people's confidence. So if you raise that issue, the mass media wants you to be leave your an election denier. We just want it done right. We want it done in a way that people have confidence in. And when a significant amount of people have no confidence in the process, that's a problem. And that's got to be corrected. And we can't drag our feet on that. All right, let's go to my loser of the week. And my loser of the week for this week is bum, ba, rum, ba, rum, ba, bum, the Pennsylvania Democrats for voting for John Fetterman. Th- there was a couple of episodes ago I had mentioned that, you know, if you vote for Fetterman, you're nothing more than just a tool of the Democratic Party, a disrespected tool of the Democratic Party. And the people of Pennsylvania proved me right. At least the Democrats of Pennsylvania proved me right. After listening to this ogre who just really, he had a stroke, he couldn't speak, he couldn't communicate, he had a terrible presentation during the one debate, lied about fracking, yet he won. And all this tells me is that the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania, and likely the Democratic Party in the United States, is calcified. As long as you have the moniker... They will vote for you. It doesn't matter what you stand for. It doesn't matter what happens to you, your state of mind, whether you had a stroke, whether you lie. As long as you have that Democratic moniker, you're going to get my vote. And they like to talk about people that support Trump as being part of a cult. What could be more cultish than just voting for somebody because he's a Democrat? He's not American. It's not good for the country. The calcification of parties is not good for the country. So for that reason, the Democrats that voted for John Fetterman are my loser of the week. So the inflation number came in this week. Uh, CPI came in at 7.7%, and that was down from 8.2% last month. So there was a lot of cheering on Wall Street. Oh, it went down. Still at 7.7%. But according to Wall Street, oh, yeah, that's a good number. Let's go with it. But let me just give you a little breakdown of what comprises that 7.7%. Okay, let's take a look at eggs. Eggs are up 43% year over year. Airline fares are up 43% year over year. Butter and margarine up 33% year over year. Transportation up 28%. Health insurance, up 20.6%. Piped gas service, up 20%. Gasoline, up 17.5%. Coffee, up 15.6%. Pet food is up 15%. Chickens, up 14.9%. Bread's up 14.8%. Milk is up 14.5%. Frozen fruits and vegetables is up. 14.1%. Electricity is up 14.1%. Cheese, up 12%. Furniture is up 11.6%. Baby food, if you can get it, it's up 10.9%. Shelter, up 6.9%. And... As I mentioned last month, televisions are down 16.5% year over year. Admissions to sporting events are down 17.7%. And smartphones are down 22%. So many of the things that affect us and that we see daily are up a heck of a lot more than 7.7%. And again, this is going to stick with us for a while. I think it'll stick with us for another year, half, two years. So we shall see. Okay, let's take a quick look at the markets. For the week, the Dow was up 4.1%. The S&P was up 5.9%. And NASDAQ was up 8.1% for the week. For the year, the Dow is down 7.13%. The S&P is down 16.22%. And NASDAQ is down 27.62%. And with that said, thank you so much for listening. You have a good week, and I will talk to you next week.